Just on Monday or so, God began to put something else on my heart and totally change the message that I was going to share tonight. So it was through a series of conversations and through some things that the Lord just impressed upon my heart that I felt like this is what's for tonight. And I, I just, even that alone, I love about the Lord because He's personal. When you read the, in Revelation the seven uh, letters to the seven churches, they weren't all the same letter. They weren't all the same things. Some of them might have had similar elements, but the church of Philadelphia is different than the church of Laodicea. The church of Philadelphia didn't need to hear the same things that the church of Laodicea and so on did. And I know for us, man, all scriptures God breathes. So it doesn't matter where you end up and where you teach from. It's going to be for us. But there are times when the Lord, he, he's saying something very specific and very particular. And I believe that he is tonight um, from his word. And before we even open up the Bible, I just want to lay this one uh, Truth, just state this one truth and then we'll, we'll go into the word knowing this, really believing this, that just like the, the Lord has a plan for our church, the enemy has a plan for the church. I, I mean the church of, of Jesus Christ and even for this church. He has a plan. His plan is very simple to divide, to create disunity and bitterness and uh, coldness. You know, the love grows cold. Uh, to get each other just having evil suspicions about one another, coming up to some you know, weird conclusions about each other. And what happens is when, when we let the enemy do this, which we're, we've all done before in our relationships with one another, when we let him do this, the hand of God comes off. The blessing of the Holy Spirit, the anointing is no longer there. God's, God's favor is not on us when we are in uh, disunity with one another. God's heart is that we would be one. And as soon as the power of God is, you know, somewhat lost from our church, we're like a lighthouse that its job is to shine the light and to guide people in, but it's not really doing anything because there's almost no light. It's very almost invisible. And Jesus said, the world is going to know that you're my disciples because you have love for one another. But what happens when that love grows cold? What happens when we let ourselves destroy that unity, that loving bond? I believe it, that the enemy desires to, to do that here in this fellowship. The church all over the world. But let's just make it personal. Our church. You, sister. You, brother. Me. You. You. Every one of us. The enemy wants to divide us. He wants there to be this coldness about us. And I always, um, I think about Jesus because just before he died, before he went into the garden and all that which led to Calvary, he was in another place after giving one of the most profound <coughs> messages, if you will. And at the end of it, he prayed to his father out loud so his disciples could hear him. And he prayed for them for the first you know, half of the prayer. And then he switched his prayer into praying for all future disciples, which is us. He prayed for us that day. And his prayer, if you go and read it in John 17, a handful of times, probably at least five times, but maybe closer to seven, eight, or nine times, he prays, Lord, Father, let them be one, just as we are one. And then the world will know that you've sent me and that you love me, you love them, if they're one. That was Jesus' prayer just before he was to go to the cross was for the unity of the brothers and the sisters who were called out of darkness. Lord, let them be one. And you know the enemy heard that prayer. You know the enemy was present. And you know the enemy works to do that here, that we would not be one. And I mean, I think about even our church uh, statement or whatever that might be called, slogan. <laughs> you know, it's not 1-800-JIFFY-LOO, but it's uh, um, that all might be one, one together, so that all might be one, W-O-N, the world, lost people might be one to Christ. So Father, once again we pray as we open up your word, and we do pray that, Lord, that you would help us to be one to be united, Lord, to, 
sacrifice our selfishness, Lord, and our wrong heart, our wrong attitude, harmful words, Lord, and thoughts, <coughs> motives, God, that aren't pure and not, not of you. Help us to lay those before you, God, and we pray you'd speak to us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to just turn to Colossians 3. And um, starting in verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So it starts with a question. If you've been raised, if that's happened to you, then here's what your life should look like. Here's what, where you should be. Well, raised from what? We've been raised from a lot. We've been raised from the dead. Ephesians 2 says that when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we, God made us alive together with Christ. We're alive. We've been brought to spiritual life. We have received the new birth. We've been raised from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. There was a time when we, we were slaves. We were slaves to sin, to ourselves, to the world, to Satan. We were slaves. The most brutal slave master. We've been raised from that. We've been raised from uh, citizenship here. You know, we, we're, we're here for a short season. We're passing through. We're pilgrims. But this is no longer our home. This used to be our home. This was it for us. This and then eternal wrath. This was it. This is as good as it got for us. But we've been plucked out of this world, out of the corrupt, uh, perverse, twisted, evil world, and placed in the, the hands of our Lord. And so our home is in heaven. We've been raised. And also from, just from the lies of Satan. We, we were at one time uh, held captive by the enemy. We were slaves to his lies. So we've been raised. And Paul says, if you've been raised with Christ, and here's what you have to do. Uh, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, and seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, if you've been risen, then now you are to live the risen life. That that's, there's a life now. If you've been risen then you are to live the risen life, which means you think differently, you love differently, you look at things differently. In fact, it affects every single area of our lives. It affects our attitudes, our thoughts, our actions, our words, our motives, down to the deepest, deepest places of our heart and our mind. We have been raised. We are not the same person anymore. But Paul, he frames it in a question, though, because not everybody is in that place. The, the question is, have you been raised? Have you been raised to life? Now look at verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's an amazing day to think of, that... I mean, we can't even comprehend it, what it's going to be like to appear with the Lord. We call on the Lord. We worship the Lord. We just, you know, no mind has, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared in advance for those who love him. But we're not going to be imagining it. We're going to be seeing it. Finally, we're going to see his glory. We're going to see him in his presence and be in his presence. But he says that we've died. We've died. Uh, Paul said in Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself up for me. So the things that used to have a, a, a mastery over me, I'm dead to it. The world that used to be my home, and this was just what I loved and what I looked for and sought after, this is where I put my affections and my, my thoughts. I set it right here on this world. I'm dead to the world now. I'm dead to it. In fact, in Galatians, um, in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 6, 
Yeah, chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's, it's not alive to me anymore. I'm dead to sin, like I mentioned a moment ago. I no longer have to obey it. You no longer have to obey sin as if, as if it's our slave master. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to say no. We have been made new creations in Christ. And that means that we live a new life. It's not something that we work up, you know, like, okay, okay, I, now that I believe the gospel and I believe that Jesus died for me, I need to start kind of working on my life a little bit. And, you know, I need to make sure my life, like, matches what I believe. So to do that, I'm just going to, you know, I'll start checking off things. I'm going to work on this. No. I mean, there's things that we need to do. There's efforts that we need to make by His grace, by His power. But this is just the reality. If you are raised, if you've been born again, then you are a different person. You're no longer the same. You can never be the same person if you've been raised to life. It's impossible. It's utterly and entirely and absolutely impossible. But the question is, if this is true, then what does it really look like in our daily life? And that's where people make a big mistake. And I'm thinking more of like seminaries and um, people who are very theologically minded, which can be good, but to the point where it's all about information and it's all about theology and the right terms. And you might be able to you know, sit down and, and come up with the best definition of what the risen life looks like. And, well, you know, we are uh, placed in a position and, and uh, you know, the Greek, the original Greek of, of that language there was uh, uh, in such a way that so and so and this and that. But you know what? You could talk about that till the cows come home and it means nothing until we can really believe and understand and see what does this mean just in my daily life. I don't care the theological language or what the right, cor correct grammatical term to describe it, but what does it look like in my life? If I've been ra raised to life and I'm told, don't seek the things that, that are on the earth, don't set your mind, don't set your affection, some uh, translations say, on the things of this earth, but instead in the things above. Well, what does it look like though? Like I, I get what it's saying. I can pretty much put two and two together and, and, and gather that, okay, so don't be worldly minded, be heavenly minded, but what does that look like? Do I just walk around and, and someone says, how's it going, brother? Oh, good, John 14, 2. Uh, I mean, is that what it is? When I'm going to the bathroom, am I trying to make illustrations? And <laughs> am I, when I'm cooking dinner, am I trying to write scriptures with the spaghetti noodles? What does it mean to be heavenly minded? Because we do know what it doesn't mean. We see, uh, just even in our imagination, some of the examples I gave, I mean, those are just silly, but we know what it means to be fake. Maybe because we've been fake at times, but also because we've seen it. You know, you've encountered people that claim to know Christ, they profess to know Him, but it's evident, as far as you can tell, we don't know the heart, but as far as you can tell that the person does not know Christ. They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. So what does it look like? And I believe that the rest of, almost the rest of this chapter, it answers that question. It shows exactly what it looks like to live the risen life. When I say risen life, I just mean the Christian life. A life that's been risen, been raised from the dead and made alive together with God in Christ. Here's what it looks like. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, and just pause for a second, therefore, what's that word therefore? In light of the fact that if this is correct of you, that you've been raised, you've been given a new life, you've been given a new heart, if that's true, then here's what you are to do. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know what? A lot of people, and, and this might be you, so if it is you, then definitely hear this. You might say things like, yeah, you know, I, uh, 
I love the Lord and I, I believe everything in the, in the scriptures. I stand on the rock of Christ. I know I've got some areas in my life, you know, lust and, and anger. And sometimes I kind of blow it. And, uh, you know, I lose my temper. I do something, I, sh I say something I shouldn't have said. And I know it's wrong. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of restraining myself. I'm getting those things under control. Uh, I'm keeping them kind of manageable. You know, I've, I've, come a, you know, I've come a little way. Those kind of mindsets about sin is entirely different than what, how Paul is looking at sin. He's not saying, figure out a way to restrain your anger. Figure out a way to manage that lust so you can get it down a little bit for crying out loud. He says, instead, he says, put it to death. Don't manage it. Don't restrain it. Don't try and figure out a way to lessen it each month until it's almost gone or maybe it's eventually gone. Put it to death right now. Kill it. Destroy it. As John Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And that is the truth. We can't say things like, oh, I've just got a lust problem. I've just got an, an, an anger problem. My dad, he had a temper and I just, it's in the genes, you know. Well, I'll tell you what's in the genes. It's sin. You were born in, in our, my mother's womb was I like conceived in sin. That's what's in the genes. And there might be some tendencies that we're all born with that might be because of uh, how our parents are and grandparents and etc. But that's no excuse. In Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord to put to death these sins. And he gives a list. This is not an all-inclusive list, but it's just some examples. Sexual immorality. And that covers, that's an umbrella that covers every form of sexual sin. So looking with lust, which Jesus says that is committing adultery. Uh, pornography. Lustful thoughts. Impurity is the next one. That, that's anything that's not pure. Your motives are not pure. Uh, the words that you're speaking are not pure. Put it to death. Passion, or some translations say inordinate affection. A, a affection that's placed on things that should never be placed on. Evil desire. Anything that you desire that's not righteous, that's not godly, that doesn't exalt Jesus. And covetousness. And then he adds, which is idolatry. So when I'm wanting something that I don't have, eh, I've just got to have it. This brother, you know, they have it. This sister, she has it. They, this family, they have it. I am actually making that desire, that thing, an idol. And I'm not talking about like a new car. Here's how it looks for a lot of us. Man, uh, if you're like a family, young family especially, or it doesn't have to be young family, man, I, I would love to have more children. They keep getting pregnant. What's up with that? Or uh, I would love to be able to get a new job. I mean, they've, this person over here, they've got a great job. I've just been in the same job for years. Man, I really would like to this or that. And that thing that you're desiring, it's taken away your satisfaction, your contentment, embracing you know, where God is, has placed you. So Paul says, here's how you treat those things. Put them to death. Put them to death. And that is harsh language. But Jesus used the same language. He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, just put it back in your pocket. No, 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 cut it off. That's what it was. Cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, just close your eyelid. Nope. Gouge it out. Gouge it out. It was aggressive. It was harsh. And his point, the heart of the Lord, is kill it. Get rid of it. And why would he ever give us a command like that unless we already have the power in him and in him alone to actually do it? Like Titus says, we have self, we've been given self-control so that we can say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live an upright and godly life in this present age. This present age is a world of, full of wickedness. You mean to say that I, I could stand against sin in this world? I mean, this world, there's too much temptation. Yes. So put, put to death the sin that's in you. And I remember a couple years, maybe like four years ago, I came across this book uh, from John Owen. He is in uh, 1600, so it's been a long time. And he was a theolo theologian. And one of his most famous books was called The Mortification of Sin. Mortification just meaning, you know, killing, putting to death. And I just want to read to you this little, this little quote from this book because it stuck with me for so long. John Owen says, Mortification 
prunes all the graces of God and makes room for them in our hearts to grow. The life and vigor of our spiritual lives consists in the vigor and flourishing of the plants of grace in our hearts. Now, as you may see in a garden, let there be a precious herb planted, and let the ground be untilled, and weeds grow about it. Perhaps it will still live, but be a poor, withering, unuseful thing. You must look and search for it, and sometimes can scarce find it. And when you do, you can scarce know it, whether it be the plant you look for or no. And suppose it be, you can still make no use of it all, at all. When let another of the same kind be set in the ground, naturally as barren and bad as the other, but let it be well weeded, and everything that's noxious and hurtful removed from it, it flourishes and thrives. You may see it at first look into the garden and have it for your use when you please. So it is with the graces of the Spirit that are planted in our hearts. That is true. They are still, they abide in a heart where there is, there, they do abide in a heart where there is some neglect of mortification, but they are, ready, they are ready to die. They are withering and decaying. The heart is like the sluggard's field, so overgrown with weeds that you can scarce see the good corn. Such a man may search for faith, love, and zeal, and scarce be able to find any. And if he do discover that these graces are there, yet alive and sincere, they are so weak, so clogged with lusts, that they are of very little use. They remain, indeed, but are ready to die. But now let the heart be cleansed by mortification, putting to death. The weeds of lust, constantly and daily rooted up, as they spring daily, nature being their proper soil, let room be made for grace to thrive and flourish. How will every grace act its part and be ready for every use and purpose? And I'm sorry for it being a little bit lengthy, but you get the picture. When we pull out the weeds of sin, we put to death the sin in our hearts. It allows for the graces, the good things of the Lord to grow in us. So Paul says, put them to death. Verse 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The, the very things that we have in our lives that sometimes we're not willing to put to death, it's because of these sins that the wrath of God is even coming. This, this description here, this is who we were. This is who we're, the life that we once lived. This is that life down here before we were raised. Why would we continue to live in sin, in the sins that we've been ransomed and delivered from? Why would we continue to engage in the same things that the Lord purchased us out of? It's because of these sins the wrath of God is coming. They shouldn't be in our lives, Paul says. In verse 7, in these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Here's a further expanded list. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene uh, talk from your mouth. Now those... That list right there dealt with more the, uh, with the tongue. And man, this tongue is a powerful and dangerous and uh, it can be a terrible weapon. It causes so much harm. Like James said, it sets a you know, little tiny spark, sets a whole forest abla ablaze. A little tiny rudder on the back of the ship turns the entire massive ship where it should go. This little tongue, our little words, they hurt, they wound. They destroy relationships. And you know what else? They grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, verse 29 and 30, Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Wow. This tongue, when I speak in anger, Back to this list here. Wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. When I am uttering these things, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, do not lie to one another. There's another sin of the tongue. Seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. And you know, the whole point here is as Paul is going through these different sins, again, this is not the full list. Like, okay, we'll just focus on these. We'll get rid of these. But the other things that aren't mentioned there, we're going to keep those going. Paul is just sharing 
uh, exactly what God has placed on his heart has inspired him to write. Maybe these are things that he's familiar with the Colossian church having a struggle with. And so he's calling it out right where they are. But here's another one, dishonesty, lying to one another. Paul is just saying these things, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the slander, the obscene talk, the lying, the sexual immorality, the impurity, the evil desire, the covetousness, all of these things, these are not becoming of a Christian. These, they don't match with the risen life. That's the old life. That's the dead man. That's the man who's a slave. That's not the person that was raised to life. That, that, that is not who you are anymore, Colossians. That's not who you are anymore, us, brothers and sisters. So you don't have to continue in these things. Instead, you are able to put them to death. Second part of verse 9, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in, the knowledge, in knowledge after the image of its creator, putting on the new self. In other words, uh, and let me read the last part of it, um, being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The new self is growing. It's growing to look more like our, our Savior. God is always working to sanctify us and to make us look more and more like Him. That's His heart. That's His desire for every one of us. Paul made it clear in 1 Thessalonians. He said, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then his first uh, command after that said, abstain from sexual immorality. This is the will of God for you. This is the will of God for me. That you would look like Jesus. And that's going to happen through sanctification. That is God's heart. That is God's desire that we would be made to look more and more like our Lord. Verse 11, here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, there is absolutely level ground at the cross. There is no super Christian. There's no one that has an advantage over someone else. No one has the, the upper hand or the, the foot forward. God shows no partiality, no favoritism. We are his children, and together we stand at the cross on level ground. So here's, the, here's what it looks like when you've got a brother or a sister that's offended you, and, and you're bothered by them, you have to realize that they stand next to you, by, you know, next to that cross, completely equal to you with their Savior who was bloodied and bruised. God loves them just as much as he loves you, just as much as he loves me. No matter how deeply offended we've been, no matter how wronged we've been, the ground here is level. Christ is all and in all, speaking of his children. Now verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So he says, put on. But before he even goes to the list, he says, but first, let me just remind you of who you are. You are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved or dearly loved. It's like he's saying, before I even tell you what to put on yourself, as you have your interactions with one another, let me first say that you have to remember that God has chosen you, that you've been predestined. God has chosen you to be his son or his daughter. He has, before the foundations of the earth, chosen you for adoption as sons and daughters of our Lord. Not only that, but he has made you holy so that you are holy and blameless before him. That's without blame. There's no condemnation. And not, not only that, but you are dearly loved. Not just loved, but dearly loved. So in light of all that, in light of how God has treated you, in light of how God has extended such love to you, here's what you put on for your brothers and sisters. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now these are the very things that Jesus wore. They, these are the very things when he interacted with people, that's what he displayed. When his disciples were constantly missing what he was trying to say and taking what he was saying and turning it into selfishness and a pursuit of getting ahead and being the one who would be exalted 
And when they would say things, when they would try to stop him and rebuke him, oh no, Jesus, that would never happen to, to you. When they would um, desert him in the, in the garden, every, every single one of them, Jesus responded to them. Yes, with truth, but with these very things. He was so patient with them. He never gave up on them. He never said, man, you know what? It's been three years. I'm sick of this. Your failures. Go back to fishing. At least one good thing, one thing you're good at. He didn't do that. He, he bore with them. With them. He, he did not lose heart. He was patient. He was humble. He actually said, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. He was their example. He got down and washed their feet just a couple nights or so before he was murdered. Even the feet of Judas who betrayed him. How humble, how gentle, how compassionate. When he looked at the crowds and he saw people who he knew pretty soon yell to have him on the cross, crucify him. And yet he was able to look at these crowds, knowing their hearts, knowing where they stand, knowing the selfishness there, and be moved with compassion. And so we're told to put these things on. I, I can't help but think about what if we only had of God's love and grace what we extended to others? What if God only gave to, to us what we gave to others? So, you know, you're not a very loving person. You're not too patient with your wife, your husband. And what if that then is how God would, would treat you? That, that would be terrible. That would be absolutely a, a nightmare. God is gracious. He extends love, steadfast love with no measure. He bears with us. He forgives us repeatedly, constantly. There was a time when Melissa and I, we were talking with someone and they were complaining about another person and we were trying to tell them, hey, you got, stop telling us, you got to go talk to that person. You got to make that, that right. And they, you know, didn't quite see it. And, um, and eventually, we parted ways. And afterward, when we were walking, uh, Melissa said to me, and I, I never forgot it, you know, all this time I haven't forgotten it. She said, you know, I guess there's a reason why the Bible says that we are to, to be long-suffering, not short-suffering with one another. Because that's the thing, we get offended and we'll be willing to bear with them for a little while. Maybe, uh, you know, till the next one. Then the next one comes. And now we've just about had it. And now we're just going to dismiss them totally from our life, from our prayers, from our love. And yet the scripture says we're to be long-suffering. Long-suffering. There's a reason it's called long-suffering. That we would not lose heart. Ephesians 5.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. I mean, just think about the way the Lord loved you. He, there was nothing about you to love. When He extended His love towards you on that cross, you didn't even acknowledge it for a lot of your life. For, for those who were saved later in life, even when you were saved uh, younger in life, there were years that you took advantage of His love, that you... That you, knowing what he did for you, just continue to live your way, do your own thing, not appreciate him, not thank him, not surrender to him. And so when someone does that to us, we do something nice to them, we are patient with them, and they don't return it to us, we just want to end it. But God has extended it to us, and we now extend it. We're called, and God will give us the grace to do it, to extend it to each other in the, in the same way. Verse 13, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That's, a, that's hard to do. Verse 14, and above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now when he says that, is in, in the context of bearing with one another, forgiving each other, loving each other. In other words, it's in the context of conflict and relationships that he says, and let there be this, this bond of peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Sometimes we don't have peace. We don't experience the peace of God because we don't have peace with one another. We, we're not striving for the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. 
And we wonder, like, why is there no peace in my heart? Why am I anxious? Why am I feeling distant from the Lord? Well, it could be that because you're not making things right with your brother. You're not making things right with your sister, with your spouse. And that peace is gone. It can't rule in your heart when you're not letting it rule in your relationships. Ephesians 4, Paul said, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you. Not, not even just here's a good idea, but I'm urging you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Eager to maintain that unity. Paul said in Romans, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. If we want the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts, we have to seek that in our relationships with one another. Verse 16, or excuse me, the last part of verse 15, and be thankful. You know, it's amazing. That's such an odd command. I mean, a lot of this stuff is talking about, you know, relationships. Pretty soon it's going to go into letting the word of Christ dwell on you richly. And then in the middle of it is just this odd, and be thankful. It almost seems out of place. But you know what the truth is? When you're not focused on yourself, and instead you're putting others before you, and you're seeking to uh, keep that unity of, of the spirit, the bond of peace, you're seeking to extend the same love that God extended to you, to them, the same patience, to them, the same long-suffering, to them, pretty soon, you're not even thinking about yourself. You're thinking about other people. And you know what happens when self gets out of the way in our thought life? And in a heart, thankfulness. You finally have room to be thankful. You've been so filled up with yourself, there's no, not, not been any room. But now all of a sudden you've got room. And you're thankful. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You know, David said, I, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We read the word for many reasons. You know, it's our food, it's our nourishment, it's our comfort, it's our hope, it's our guide, our direction. But another thing is, it keeps us from sin. By reading God's word, by meditating on it, by planting it inside of our hearts, it protects us. It makes us strong against temptation. We learn promises that we can, we can begin to take refuge in when temptation comes. So we're told, let it, let it dwell in you. Not just dwell in you, but dwell in you richly. Let it be so uh, present in your heart, in your mind. Like the psalmist, like David, when he said, you know, I don't walk in the way of sinners or stand in the seat of scoffers or, or sit in the seat of mockers, but my delight is in the law of the Lord, which is the word of God. Or here, the word of Christ. And on his word, I meditate day and night. That's amazing to be able to say that this is my delight. I delight to meditate on your word. Job said, I've treasured your word more than my daily bread. The word of Christ. Dwell in your hearts richly. In verse 17, last verse for tonight. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything we do, it's all for Jesus. That's the risen life. The risen life is it's for Jesus' glory. The risen life is to make much and to exalt greatly Jesus alone. Sometimes, as we come to a close here in a moment, and let me just say this. I might not deliver this the best because I've struggled getting through this, honestly. But I know this is the, the heart of God for tonight. And I think I've struggled a little bit because uh, I think in a sense it almost confirms to me that this is God's heart. Because I feel the enemy trying to, to take what the Lord definitely gave to me for, for my own life. But I know it's for this church. And I, I can feel the enemy trying to rob it. And I just want to take a moment to pray. Lord, I, I don't know the things that my brothers and sisters here are facing, Lord, and I don't know the kind of things that the enemy's doing in their life. But I do know that just as you're here tonight, I know the enemy's here. Not, not that we need to be afraid. And not that he has the victory, because he certainly doesn't. 
Greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. But Lord, we do need to be aware of his schemes. It's a foolish, foolish thing to go through life and not be aware of the plots and the schemes and the tactics of our enemy. And Lord, tonight, we have an enemy not just of us individually, but we have an enemy of the church, of this fellowship, of your church, your people. And I pray, Lord, that you would seal this word to our hearts. Seal it to our hearts, imperfectly shared, but seal it to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. You're the best teacher. Make it personal, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll just close with these final couple of thoughts. You can talk all day about what it means to, to live victoriously, to, to live this risen life. And you can study the scriptures, and you can read books, and you can go to conferences. You can go to conferences on almost any, on any topic. You can read books on almost any topic. And sometimes they can be helpful. But if you want to know what it looks like in real life, the truth is, it's not pretty to the flesh. It's not what you want it to be, the sinful flesh. Because what it is, it's just simply death to self. And who wants that? Naturally, who wants that? Nobody does. That's why when people, when Jesus would say things to people like, take up your cross and follow me, you must hate your brothers and sisters and mothers when you must do this and that, people would be offended. Masses would leave him. They would no longer follow him. They would, uh, the rich young ruler, okay, sell all your possessions. Show that I will be your God, not money. And what did he do? He walked away sad because they don't, people don't want to die to themselves. That's the world, but Christians, we, if we're not careful, we don't want to die to ourselves because there's a certain element of comfort and satisfaction in just kind of doing our thing. You know, what works for me. Oh, I believe all those. I totally believe the gospel. I, Jesus died, rose again. You know, he loves, he loves me. He made that sacrifice. I do believe it. But, oh, you just cut me off in traffic. You know, or this sister, she just did it again. She left me out. She didn't invite me. Or this brother, he's over here, and he told me he was going to bring me along. And, he, and now all of a sudden, the things that we believe, they're not really evident in the way that we're treating people and the way that our, we're interacting with one another. And God's heart is that we would recognize that and that we would heed the word of God. So that when God, and I'm not even going to say what, when Paul says, I'm just going to say, so that when God says, put to death, sin, that we would say, okay, Lord, I don't exactly know how that's going to work, but I trust that as I resist the devil and submit myself to you, the devil will flee. I trust, Lord, that when that, and temptation comes, that when you said that, no temptation has overtaken you except what's common to man and that with the temptation, I will provide a way of escape so that you can stand up under it and endure it. I trust that you really will. So that when Joseph is tempted by this beautiful woman and he's alone, no one will ever even know. And he's a, he's a young man, so he's definitely you know, in that place. And he's good looking as well, so she's attracted to him. It's the most perfect opportunity for sin. It's the perfect storm. I love the example of Joseph. And when that temptation came, he denied it many times up to that greatest moment. But when that greatest moment came, he ran out of the house and he specifically said, how can I do this great sin against my God? He was able to stand up under temptation, the greatest temptation. God says to us, put these things to death. And as you're putting these to death, put these things on. Things that go with the new life. Things that are the character of our Savior. Patience. Gentleness. Kindness. Humility. I think I even left off one of the verses, which was verse... Um, in fact, one of the most important verses, which is verse uh, 14... And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together 
in perfect harmony. We are to put these things on in our daily life, in our relationships, as we speak with one another. What I would say tonight, as Josh uh, comes back up, is there's at least three things just to take away. One is that we just got to bear with one another. Instead of getting offended and, and turning away from the brother, the sister, the family member, the spouse, we've got to bear with one another. Love covers a multitude of wrongs. The proverb writer, he said that it's a glory to overlook an offense. Sometimes things need to be dealt with and, and we need to confront someone. But a lot of times we just need to forgive them. We just need to overlook it. We just need to cover it over with love. It's hard, but we need to be able to embrace conflicts as an opportunity to, to learn more about forgiveness and love. It's hard to do that because you just want to respond. Another thing to mention is that when we do have something against another person, that, and especially if it's an actual sin, it's not just like a suspicion, like, oh, what'd she say? What'd she do? What did he do? But like, you know they've sinned against you. There's something clearly wrong there. Then we need to go to that person, not to this person. Man, I got to tell you, man, Bob, I can't believe it. I overheard him speaking to his wife. You, should, you would not believe what he said to his wife. I, I got to tell you, Susan, uh, Sally, whoever, well, I'm trying to think of a, a woman's name who's not in our church. Uh, <laughs> Sally, there's no Sally, right? Sally, I just can't believe it. You know, she uh, rolled her eyes at me when I walked by. You know, instead of going to somebody else, we go to the person. Bob, hey, I overheard you speaking with your wife, and I heard what you said, and, and brother, that was, that was really harsh, you know? Are, you, are things going okay at home? Hey, Sally, hey, I noticed, maybe it was nothing, but I noticed you rolled your eyes and you've been kind of irritable toward me. Did I, did I offend you in some way? Is there something I did? And look how, look at the, the healing that comes about. Rather than going to somebody else and talking about the person, the healing and the blessing is upon that. Because that is how God has directed us to resolve our conflicts. Matthew 18, you go, your brother sins against you, you go to your brother and you show him her, their faults, not somebody else. So we need to go to the person that we've been offended by. And lastly, is that if you do have something against someone, they've sinned against you, or you just think that maybe they've sinned against you. They just don't seem to treat you right for whatever reason. And if that's really bothering you and that's on your heart, man, you need to urgently meet with them and make it right. Jesus said, if you come to the altar to give your gift and suddenly you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift here. There's something more important to do. Go make things right with that brother, that sister. Go be reconciled. Then come back and give your gift. It's almost like God is saying, okay, you want to come and worship me? You want to come and, and have communion with me? But you've got something against your brother or sister, you need to take care of that. Because listen, when you go take care of that, I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna help you. And by you doing that, that's gonna be death to self. And you know I'm definitely gonna be all over that. The Lord is all over death to self because that's where he's able to live and show his power and his glory. So Lord, that's our prayer tonight. Our prayer tonight, Lord, we know that the enemy seeks to divide us, Lord, and to cause disunity and hardness and offense, insult. He seeks, Lord, to split us apart from each other. And Lord, even tonight, as I've been sharing, I know that you've brought people to our minds that either we've sinned against them or they've sinned against us that we know we need to make that right. I pray that you give us grace, Lord. Whatever that situation is, whatever that relationship is that needs some healing, I pray you'd give us grace, Lord, and power from your Holy Spirit to go do it, to make that right. And Lord, as we enter into a time of prayer and worship, will you please just lead us, Lord, 
Teach us how to pray. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, Lord. Help us to put to death our sins. Help us to set our minds and our affections on things above, the things of God. Help us to put on love, compassion, humility, meekness, kindness. And to be able to, with those things on, to bear with one another. So when brother, sister, sandpaper comes our way, we can embrace them. We can love them, knowing that they are a means of grace. You're using them like that thorn in the flesh. You're using brother sandpaper to make us more patient. You're, miss, you're using sister gossip to make us more gentle and humble. Help us to embrace those difficult conflicts for your glory, Lord. We just surrender to you. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. This altar area will be open for anybody that wants to come up and pray. And as Josh leads us in a song, after the song, we've got a few minutes. Um, as you feel led to pray, just pray out loud so we can hear and agree. And after a little bit, we'll close in another song.
time would have drawn short. They are so precious. I feel your love for them in prayer. I feel your concern for them. Your desire to spend time with them. Fellowship with them. I lift them all up to you, Father, and ask that you will know your perfect will. Your holy will. Be done in all their lives. And in the last of the children. Thank you for all the words of care put in my heart for them. Thank you for keeping them and drawing them closer to you. I thank you, Lord, for protecting them with your head and your protection, strengthening the marriages, yes. drawing those that have been on the on the fence, so to speak, closer. Thank you, Father, that you're building a unity here. As you said in that first night we got together four years ago, over four years ago now, in that house after Scott, we left Calvary. You said that you were raising us up for your glory, the glory of Jesus Christ. You said that some would leave and you'd bring others and you would fulfill that. You said it was to reach out to the lost of the Tampa Bay area, and that is being fulfilled. God, I thank you for each and every one of these people, the ones that sing, the ones that teach, the ones that do construction work, the ones that clean, the ones that take care of the children. Father, I thank you for the privilege of sitting on the wall and watching and praying. are all so precious. You've allowed me to feel your love. Compassion for every one of them. Not one is eliminated from you. Lord, through your promise to give them their heart's desire, not their mind or soul's desire. Their heart's desire, the new heart, that soft heart, that fleshy heart. That desire is to fill your will, fill your will in these last days. This darkness gets darker. This place will be a lighthouse. A lighthouse of your glory. With Jesus reigning and ruling in each one of them. And a love like the world this nation has not seen in a long time. Have your way with each and every one of us. Thank you for not giving up on God. Thank you for not giving up on us, Lord, on me. Thank you for the discipline, Lord, that, that I deserve, Father, showing me that you love me, Lord. Father, help me to hate sin, to run from it, to hate the things of this world, to never put anything in front of you ever again. Lord, you're so patient and loving, but so just. And I love you for being just. Call 
the sea to still, the rage in me to still. Oh, 
kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen yours is the kingdom yours is the power but your Holy Spirit illuminates it and directs it as individualized arrows that go right to certain areas of our heart, Lord. And it hits each of us in different ways, different places. We thank you, Lord. You know what we need to hear. You know what, what we need from you, God, our manna. Pray that you would not allow the enemy to, like a bird, to come along and take away the seed that was planted tonight. Lord, help us to, help us to love you, Lord, and to love our brothers and sisters. You summed up all the law in two, command, two commandments, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love our, our neighbor as ourself. Help us to do that, Lord, to grow in your love, to be imitators of God, to walk in love as you, Jesus, walked in love and gave yourself as a sacrifice. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Please keep us safe. Please lead us in your perfect will, Lord. And God, once again, if there's things in our heart that we have against another person, or we know that they have it against us. For whatever reason, help us, Lord, to have the grace from you to go make that right, Lord, to be peacemakers, to build bridges, Lord, by bridges of grace, bridges of mercy, bridges of love that sometimes, in some cases, just totally overlook the offense. Help us, Lord. We thank you, God. And at this time, if you have children, you're welcome to go ahead and get them. We're going to continue in some prayer and worship. And uh, the area up here, of course, is, uh, is open. Oh 